Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Can you guys, everybody hear me in the back? Yes, perfect. All right. Uh, we are uh, going to get started. Again, thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully everybody was able to get to the uh, keynote address yesterday, which uh, was excellent from Gail, but also stole some of our thunder, at least my thunder. <laughs> so uh, I will go through a little bit quicker so we have time to talk about the end because I think this is a great topic and people have a lot of questions. If uh, Depending where you are on the spectrum, all of us either have a program or are on our way to getting a program. Um, or, uh, and so I think there's been a lot of valuable lessons that uh, we hope to share today. We have no conflicts of interest. Uh, I forgot, I'm Jason Hoppe. Uh, I'm going to go first. I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction, give you the why do we care about this subject, and then a little bit of intro about the drug itself. Um, and then we'll hear, uh-oh. I'm not going to touch anything. And then uh, we'll talk about some of the laws that you can understand what's available to you. Uh, the literature specifically for the emergency departments, and then really how do you, what can you take back to your own site to try and start a program uh, if interested. And so a lot of these, you probably, it's now day two of this, and um, I know we all probably hopefully agree that there's an opioid crisis, but uh, we are making headway as far as prescribing. So uh, there was sort of a turning point a couple years ago, and we're also doing a, a better job of high risk prescribing. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't correlated with deaths. Um, we still see them going up mainly with synth synthetics, uh, but we also think that there's uh, association with people being exposed uh, by the opioids that, that, that we write. So it's important that we both address our prescribing but address those at risk, and, and that's kind of the next step in what we'll talk about today. And those at risk are not a homogeneous population. So um, you can see here death rates from heroin uh, versus uh, prescribed opioids by by age, and you can see that there's still a younger group, uh, which I think a lot of people really classically think of as people with opioid use disorders that may come in with a needle in their arm or, um, you know, an abscess, and those are kind of easier to identify, but we have to recognize that there's an older population of patients that are on prescription opioids, and we talk about, or you consider screening, you need to talk about how we screen those patients to identify patients at risk. The good news is uh, they're coming to the emergency department uh, and they're coming to the hospitals. So uh, you can see here the number of hospital-related visits and admissions for patients with OUDs have uh, increased. Uh, and so we are, like a lot of things, the door to the hospital and the door to these patients. And so there is potential for our, a, a wide-reaching impact as we become more comfortable with uh, prescribing uh, MAT. Just a level set kind of when we, what the status quo is currently. Uh, lots of people, two million people with opioid use disorder last year. I'm sure that number will still go, will continue to rise as we get more data. And only one of five uh, received treatment. So there's a major gap there. Um, and like a lot of things, uh, the emergency department can fill that gap and probably do it better than other, any other group like chest pain or anything else. So hopefully you can take that away. Uh, and depending where you practice, there's a bigger gap. So um, here you can see some of the darker is worse in this map. Um, and s some states have clearly made more progress than others, and some of this is obviously related to uh, the number of patients requiring treatment. So just uh, introduction, so it's a chronic illness, substance use disorders uh, is a chronic illness, and it requires a lot of things that we do well uh, on a daily basis. So prevention and screening, you know, we, every patient that comes in, hopefully every patient that comes into all of our EDs gets, talk, gets asked about suicide, domestic violence. Um, things like that, and uh, HIV, and so we, we've really gotten uh, excellent at screening patients up front, identifying patients at risk. Empathy in patients, we do that on a, a daily basis, right? We're the only people in the hospital that see both the CEO and someone who's homeless in the same shift, so I think we're accustomed to uh, dealing with difficult populations. Uh, medication management, uh, whether you like it or not, you're doing. And if nothing else, what you're doing is harm reduction, which is something else emergency departments are, are excellent at, and that is getting people on MAT, replacing any, any IV drug use with something safer uh, is a benefit, even if it's for short term, recognizing that as a chronic disease, there is going to be a lot of recidivism and it's going to be kind of an up and down course for a lot of patients. Um, and overall, uh, if you saw the presentation yesterday, there was a great graph of what it looks like to be an IV drug user. So you have very high, you have big highs, lows, and you spend a lot of your time trying to get, get that leveled out. Um, and this MAT re replacement uh, allows you to 
suppress the withdrawal and kind of normalize your physiology so that you can function. Um, and that translates into much better outcomes. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff out there, mainly on methadone. Uh, we'll have more on buprenorphine as we go. But really changing people's lives, decreasing drug use, deaths, uh, hospitalizations, healthcare utilization while increasing their um, productivity and uh, retention in programs and long-term health. And so I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of actually buprenorphine if you're considering getting your X waiver. Scott's going to talk a little bit more about it. But this drug has been around for a while. It's been, it was a pain reliever since the 70s. Um, nowadays, we m mainly see it mixed here in the combo with naloxone. That's not true in Europe. They use a lot of straight buprenorphine in Europe. Um, so there is a little bit of differences, and we can talk about why that's combined in a second. But uh, the main policy change was in 2000, although uh, it wasn't FDA approved. Suboxone and uh, Subutex were not FDA approved for office use for a couple years later. And then there's been a series of generics that come out, and then the, the, main, the uh, main pharmaceutical companies keep changing the formulation to try and stay ahead. But there are a lot of generics out there when you talk about cost, which is, which is a major issue. And then technologically, there's now sub-Q implants. And then recently, as, mu as recent as this year, there's now um, IM injections, depot injections, that will get you two to four weeks of coverage. So in, uh, in short, three things about buprenorphine to keep in mind. So higher activity, uh, sorry, higher affinity for the receptor, and you can see the KIs here. Um, the lower the number, the higher the affinity. So that's important from a, a couple of perspectives. One, uh, precipitating withdrawal. So, so patients have to be in withdrawal uh, and feeling bad when you start them, uh, particularly methadone, which is a long-acting uh, long opioid. Uh, agonist, and so otherwise you're going to knock it off the receptor and potentially precipitate withdrawal. It works the other way too, uh, meaning if you will have all your receptors bound and you introduce something else with a lower affinity, that it's unlikely that you're going to get the intended high or intended consequences of that. So you have to keep that in mind both with uh, illicit use, but also if you're, if you're managing pain, um, that these patients, you may have to go to higher doses, and sometimes that becomes an issue, particularly in post-op patients. Um, it's a partial agonist, so not only is it going to bind well, but it's not going to have the same effects. And so this is the classic uh, curve that you'll see. And really, the, the direct agonist, full agonist, you're going to have that dose response, whereas you get a ceiling effect once you have all of the, you have a high affinity, all the receptors are bound, but you're not getting as much activity. Uh, and so the, the effects there are potentially, uh, are less euphoria, potentially less uh, withdrawal. Uh, some of that withdrawal may have to do with the, with the next question, which is that it is uh, very long-lasting. And so for abstinence, your, your relative half-life there is, is long. And so uh, that's useful for withdrawal. Usually bad withdrawals that we see are people that are on short-acting things, that people that stack them and then suddenly stop. Uh, but remember that the analgesia is a lot shorter. And I think it's important because you're going to see, as we look for alternatives to straight opioid agonists, I, I think... Uh, partial agonists are going to have a role in analgesia as we go forward, uh, and it's important to keep that in mind. That here we see a lot less respiratory depression. The main issue with that, or the main example, would be methadone. Methadone became a popular pain medicine for a while, and uh, for those of you who remember, we had a huge spike in methadone deaths, and most of that was because of this, that the relative half-life is much longer than the analgesic half-life, and so people get a response, and then they start stacking because they no longer have any analgesia, and then it, it builds up over time. Hopefully less of an issue with a, as a partial agonist, but um, I think it remains to be seen uh, the efficacy and safety of this as a pain medicine. Even though it's been around a long time, I think if there's going to be a resurgence, it's something to keep an eye on. And then the absorption. So this is mainly given sublingual, except for the IM and depo that I talked about, uh, which is uh, advantageous to patients because the buprenorphine's uh, very available, whereas naloxone's not, right? And I talked about the combination being the four to one. That's if you try and uh, divert and inject, uh, then you're going to get mainly the naloxone. That does not mean that there's not a street value to these medications. Um, which is a question I think that comes up a lot. Uh, when you look at the cost of drugs on the street, or sorry, the relative, the, the street RX is a good site. If you haven't been to, you can see how much something costs in your area. Um, Suboxone, uh, we don't have that much butte, but Suboxone has a lower value, but it's not zero. So people that are looking for something uh, that have nothing else will ride out, either ride out the withdrawal, the 45 to 60 minutes of naloxone lasts in order to get the other, the other time range on top. Um, uh, 
or they'll try and you know use it the intended way. So there is a there is a bit of a uh, there's a potential for abuse, but we think it's a lot lower. I think the other thing that, to remember there with that sublingual absorption is kids. Um, so basically, if you're a child and you're opioid naive and you put it in your mouth like they do with most pills, you're getting the entire dose. That's the intended way to deliver the drug. So anytime you hear anything about a child getting into a film or uh, sublingual preparation, you should assume that they've gotten it and that they are going to get sick um, and that they should be observed for 24 hours. It's become less of an issue. There's some data come out recently about packaging. So the films, uh, Divior changed the packaging in the films and now there are individual packages that have to be unwrapped and there's uh, some evidence that that's decreased childhood exposures. But something to remember, even though it's, a, it's safer than a full agonist, if you have nothing, it's probably a full, you know, it's equivalent to a full agonist to somebody who's opioid naive. Um, and I think we'll do questions uh, at the end. That's all I have. Do you want to address it? Yes. All right, great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so I, I get to do the, uh, the exciting middle part of the talk, which is about policy. <laughs> But I found that as this is becoming more mainstream, a lot of people are very curious about the Data 2000 Act and how you can actually get your waiver. And there's a lot of confusion out there about what that actually is and the requirements, so I thought it would be useful to go through that. First, I did want to just really quickly talk about the evidence. Hopefully you're all aware of this, this paper um, with, um, uh, by Dr. D'Onofrio, Dr. Bernstein, uh, which really has been a seminal paper as far as starting MAT in the ED. So just very briefly in this paper, I'm sure you've heard of this before, there's about 100 people in each group, about, one, about 100 in the, just the plain referral group, which is our standard of care. Uh, this is our list of resources that you can follow up with. Another 100 had that with a brief negotiating interview, and then the final 100 were randomized to get, actually get buprenorphine from the ED. And the numbers are staggering. You know, if you look at 30 days, about 37% in the, the initial of the standard of care group we're in treatment at 30 days compared to 78% in the buprenorphine group. And this is, this is amazing. This is something that we rarely see in trials these days, such a big difference. But I, you know, I think a lot of the policymakers, especially ones that I've been meeting with recently, have this, this thought that if we just get all the emergency physicians waived and wavered and they can start prescribing, then we're all set. And it's going to take care of all the problems that they have. But it's important to look back at the, the study and see exactly what they did. So they did do the brief negotiating interview. They started buprenorphine if the patient was in withdrawal already. And of course, as Jason said, you don't want to precipitate withdrawal. So for a lot of patients, they actually gave a prescription for buprenorphine. And that was to 57% of patients. So I'm going to talk about the three-day rule in a little bit. That's where you can actually give buprenorphine from the ED. But for the majority of patients in the study, they just needed a prescription until they started feeling enough withdrawal symptoms that they could start the bup. And then the other thing that's important is that they were connected with a clinic that had uh, 10 weeks of office-based treatment with established protocols. And this is the part that the, the policymakers don't understand, that there, there's a lot more than just giving the prescription from the ED. So let's talk about uh, buprenorphine overall. I know Jason alluded to it also. It actually was synthesized back in the 60s, and they were looking for a safer alternative to morphine. But what they found in animal studies is that it, it actually did reduce dependence. And so they first used it in the 70s, first for pain. And then it was used in Europe for several decades. And then it, you know, usually things go here. It takes a while to get, get approved here. And so the manufacturer um, lobbied for Congress to allow for outpatient treatment with this medication. And you have to think that, that at the time, there was only methadone. And methadone was given out at clinics. And so this idea of treating this with a new medication that you could, you could just prescribe to a patient was, was outside the box for a lot of the, the policymakers. And so they came up with the text of this Data 2000 Act, or the Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000. And the idea was to provide this waiver. And the question is, what, what is it waiving? And that is actually to, dis, to, to prescribe this medication that before was just given through a clinic, like a methadone clinic. And the way they wrote the law is it says that this applies to any Schedule 3, 4, and 5 medication that's, that's approved for this indication. And so it actually is not limited to buprenorphine, but there's only buprenorphine. <laughs> so there's, there's no other drugs in this category, but they wrote the law specifically for only that indication. If, if another manufacturer comes up with an analog that's used uh, that's similar to buprenorphine, they could certainly do that, and it, it would apply under this law. Now, do you guys know who wrote the law? It's a little bit of history. I, right, I heard it? 
Orrin Hatch was one of them. This is in the days when the government actually worked together. <laughs> so it was actually, so it was perfect. So Orrin Hatch was Uncle Joe, and it was uh, Carl Levin. So kind of some big heavy hitters in politics were the, the primary authors of this bill, which I thought was very interesting. And the requirements for this are, you have to have an active state medical license, you have to have a valid DEA, and then if you get your specialty or subspecialty uh, certification in addiction medicine, then you're also set. You don't, you don't have to take an additional waiver course. That would be a little bit silly. But the idea was that they did want to bring this type of treatment to primary care. And so the idea was that they said, well, we'll have you take an eight-hour course. And this is the text of the bill with the changes through the year. You don't have, obviously don't have to, to read this, but just to show you that this is, this is pretty much a living document. Uh, it was approved in 2000, and it's been changed in 2005, 2006, 2016. So it is, it is modifying with the times. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if we do see a future modification based on the new indications that we're using it for within the ED. You have to be a qualifying practitioner, which basically means a licensed practitioner. And this is for the treatment of opioid use disorder, including maintenance, detox, overdose reversal, and relapse. But the other part that I was talking about about policy and policymakers is that within the law, you basically have to have the capacity to provide or you can refer to appropriate counseling and ancillary services. So again, if you're, if you're prescribing but you don't have access to those other services, then you're not allowed to prescribe essentially by, by the bill. There's also confusions about the numbers of patients you can treat. Um, so you're allowed 30 patients in your first year. After one year of that, you can apply for an extension to 100 and then now the new regulations allow you up to 275. For most of us in this room, it, doesn't, it really doesn't apply to us because this is really uh, simultaneous patients that you're treating. So if you're just treating with a two-day prescription or a three-day prescription and then that's the last time that you're actually prescribing to that individual, then you're okay with this. The education is eight hours. They were very flexible about how you can do the education too. You can take it in a classroom, you can take it online, you can do a webinar. Um, so they were very open about that. And they did specify five organizations that can provide uh, the, the CME or the, the, the appropriate course, um, but the Secretary of HHS could also approve other organizations. So like if ASAP or SAM or AEM wanted to come up with their own course, they could, they would just have to get it approved by Secretary of HHS. Now one of the unfortunate things is that they made this decision that PAs and NPs have to do 24 hours of education, uh, which for us has been really tragic because we have a lot of PAs that, that work in our department and they would love to be able to prescribe as well too. Um, residents still can, they can do the eight hours, but you need the full DEA license to be able to prescribe. And so that kind of depends on your state. Some states will allow you to get a full license during residency. The education is pretty broad. Uh, the eight hours, it's about opioid maintenance and detox, how you use the drugs, including naltrexone and methadone and, and obviously buprenorphine, uh, how to do assessments, uh, counseling, staffing roles, diversion control. So it's probably a little bit more than most of us need, but that's part of the eight-hour course. And there are other ways to get waived, too. I thought this was interesting in the, in the bill also. If you happen to be part of a clinical trial that helped get an approval for a medication that would help uh, opioid treatment, or opioid use disorder treatment, which brought, you know, people that were doing the studies for buprenorphine, they automatically got their waiver. So if you're doing some innovative study, then you can probably petition uh, the government to do that. But the, the part that I, I thought was interesting here is that if the state medical licensing board considers that you have the appropriate training, they could also petition the government and, and allow you to get your waiver. And I think that's important for us because we're looking around the country that to lower the barrier for ED use, then we don't want to have all emergency physicians have to do this eight hour course when we probably only need a couple hour course. So if we can figure out the ways that our states can help support us with in that way, then they can actually use this little clause in the bill. Now, have you heard of, you've heard of the three-day rule? Yeah, so people think that the three-day rule is actually part of this, but it's actually separate. Um, it's part of this 20, 21 CFR. And this is that you can administer, but not prescribe, a quote-unquote narcotic drug for the purpose of relieving acute withdrawal symptoms while arranging for a patient's referral to treatment. So this is in federal statute. The issue with this is that you can't give more than one day at a time. So this is problematic. Remember in Dr. D'Onofrio's study, there was 57% of people had to go, went home with a prescription because they weren't in withdrawal yet. This says you have to give it in the ED. 
and then they have to come back every day for three days if you're going to do that. And it actually says in the law that this can't be renewed. It's for 72 hours only. Currently to get waivered, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, there's two providers that are mainly doing the, the teaching. There's the American Society of Addiction Medicine. They have an online only course, which for, for attending physicians is, is $199. It's a lot cheaper for other practitioners. Um, and then there's also multiple half and half courses. You can take four hours online, four hours in person. And this provider's clinical support system, they offer it for free. Um, you have to basically follow along a webinar and then you do the online portion as well too. So if, if you, if you want to do this, it's very easy. Just go to this website. Um, it's offered multiple times per month. Once you complete the course, that's not all. You um, have to go to the website from SAMHSA and then apply for it. This doesn't cost any, anything additional. You just basically put your information in that you took the course and then they'll ma mail you your, your new DEA certificate that has your old number and then your new one that has an X in front of it. Now, just a quick uh, bonus round. Have you guys heard of 42 CFR? So this is this thing that's it's a federal protection against certain types of medical <laughs> records. And what they did is that they, they wanted people to get treatment. They recognized there was stigma and that people might not seek treatment for fear of their medical records getting out and being shared, sometimes even with their primary care physicians. And so it really restricts the disclosure of records that would identify a patient as, as having an opioid or alcohol or other substance use disorder. So in most cases, patients do have to consent to share these records. Now, it doesn't necessarily apply to the ED because unless you're, you're holding yourself out as primarily treating this issue, like you're a, you're a clinic that's treating, um, then you don't, you don't need to have this apply to you. But you know, just like we have geriatric EDs, if we do eventually have a substance use disorder treatment wing of our ED, they would, they would apply for this 42 CFR part two. And so the bottom line here is that especially if you're, and I'm sure Kate will talk about this a little bit too, if you're connecting with another clinic, then it's better to get just the consent up front from patients to share this data, because otherwise you're gonna have limitations within your, your records, um, particularly with uh, those of us that have complicated EHRs. So I'm gonna end there, that was the boring policy part, and Kate's gonna take over with actually how you do it. My name is Kate Hawk. I'm glad to be here today. Um, so um, thank you guys for that introduction. And the question is, so we've heard all this and saw Gail's fabulous talk yesterday, but how do you actually integrate this into your practice and do it in the emergency department? And another thing which I hope may apply to some of you, um, how do you actually go about setting up a program in your emergency department and kind of um, gather the, the input and um, get a program up and running? So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the context of all of the things that we do around patients um, with opioid use disorder in the emergency department, because while um, ED initiated buprenorphine and referral for tr treatment is incredibly important and we know that it works, um, you know, that's only really available to people who are, you know, ready to accept that treatment at that point. So it's important to um, have other options and other um, modes, modalities of linking people to treatment. So for example, we also do, um, in the middle we have brief intervention and referral for treatment. That's our project to start. It's been functioning in our ED for about 18 years. Um, we also have overdose prevention and naloxone distribution. Um, and then the third kind of thing that we do and offer for patients with opioid use disorder is the buprenorphine referral to treatment. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so uh, what I have, I just wanted to walk you through the, the form that we have here, because I feel like that's kind of the easiest way to look at um, how we um, do it in our emergency department. And then I'll take a step back and kind of walk you through the important things that may be um, needed for you to do, to do this at your institution. Um, so for this form, oh, so for this form here, it just has some basic um, demographic data, and this is a form that um, our department chair, um, Gil D'Onofrio, basically agreed on with lo several local treatment centers, and basically set up these arrangements where um, we agreed that this is a problem, we agreed that this is something that we were needed to do for patients in our community, um, and they agreed to take our patients, you know, within a couple of days if we start them on buprenorphine in the emergency department. And so we had kind of a discussion around the things that, um, that you know, they wanted us to do to help to facilitate that care and what we needed to feed back to them in order to, for them to know that these patients were coming to them. And so um, initially, so there's some basic demographics and basic history data. Um, we do a DSM-5 um, for, uh, make sure they have moderate or severe 
um, opioid use disorder, uh, a CALS, which is a clinical opioid withdrawal scale, which I'll show you a little bit more. Um, we have, in the past, initially we do urine toxicology and LFTs, although um, it's in the last kind of year or so that's becoming um, a little bit more flexible as we think about how we can expedite this care and really um, you know, help serve people and get them in and out of the emergency department. And what, what do we really need to do in the emergency department? And so that's something that's been a little bit on flux um, in our department. Um, so there's also some information here about the details of the buprenorphine prescription that they get from us. Um, whether you know they got dosed in the emergency department, you know how how many um, um, how many films they are, were prescribed, um, and kind of when that happened. Um, as Scott mentioned earlier, we you know certainly do a lot of unobserved inductions um, in the initial study, and then we also I also certainly do um, a pretty reasonable amount in our emergency department now. Um, and so, you know, it's important to make sure that they have enough to get to the next appointment, um, and. Um, we communicate that to them. So down here are just the, the kind of five different treatment centers that we have, and um, it's a little bit complicated, but what's, what's nice about it is they all have kind of slightly different things. Um, you know, there's, you know, one that doesn't, you know, will take people without insurance, and one that, you know, has integrated with um, dual diagnosis and, and, you know, a psychiatrist kind of on staff, and so, you know, it's nice to have, have some options around, um, you know, the specific needs of each individual patient, although I recognize that I am just incredibly fortunate to practice in and New Haven in a very, very rich treatment um, area, and this is not going to be the, the case in many places. Um, so these are, um, this is just the, the criteria for um, opioid use disorder based on DSM-5 diagnosis, and I just put this up here because we basically load it onto our EPIC toolbar. Um, you know, you can just do a drop-down menu and be like, oh, here's the, here's the, in the, the mini skid, um, you know, for diagnosing opioid use disorder. Um, and then we also have the opioid withdrawal scale there. And so all of that's kind of integrated into our EMR. And so if you're on a shift, you know, you can just go open EPIC and basically print out those three, um, these three forms. Um, and I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about the COWS. Um, I don't know, are you guys familiar with this or not? Okay. Um, but essentially all it is is it's um, a withdrawal scale that um, helps you know kind of where your patient is at um, and when, um, you know, it makes sense to, to uh, dose them in the emergency department. So I'd like to take a minute just to go through this algorithm. Um, this is um, an algorithm that um, was developed with a con a, in conjunction with many people, including and Andrew Herring here and Ryan McCormick at a meeting at NIDA um, in January. And essentially it was, you know, a handful of people who were kind of doing this around the country trying to figure out how, um, how can we distill this in a way that is, um, you know, translatable and, and easily accessible to people. And so I'll just walk you through it real quickly. Um, so, you know, we have someone who, you know, <laughs> doesn't meet criteria for moderate to severe opioid use disorder, um, who, so you assess for opioid type and mass use. Um, patients taking methadone, um, we usually stay away from just because, as Jason alluded to earlier, the, the potential for precipitative withdrawal. Um, you know, every program is going to have their own nuances and their own of protocols, but in general, um, that's one of the things that we should just avoid if, you know, they've held up during the last 24 to 48 hours. Um, and so we do the cows, and if the cows is um, less than seven, um, or is less than eight, um, then we don't necessarily, don't do a dose in the emergency department. And if there is a waiver pro provider available to prescribe, which I'm happy to say, Kiel has been um, <laughs> working incredibly hard. Uh, and so I think actually we have all of our, almost all of our faculty are waived as of, um, this, this month, maybe next month. Um, so that's less of an issue for us, but you know, in the real world, that is, is certainly um, you know, a challenge to try to figure out how you can actually develop these protocols in places where you may not have waiver physicians. And there are ways to do it. There are lots of creative ways um, to do that. So, um, so if, you, if they're not, if their house is less than eight, um, and you can send them a prescription, you basically send them home with a prescription. Um, there's, you know, I usually do eight milligrams the first day and then six day two and three. Um, there are other protocols out there where you know, people are considering higher dosing. Um, but so there's some op op options around that, uh, but that's what we kind of did in the paper and that's been continued to be our practice at Yale. Um, if their cows is more than eight, um, you can do uh, four to eight um, sublingual, you basically observe. Um, and in general, people start feeling much, much better um, within about 20 minutes or so. And if it's not something that you've seen before, um, I encourage you to to learn about it <laughs> and to see, I mean, it really is, it can take a patient who is 
incredibly uncomfortable, incredibly miserable, you know, tremulous and vomiting and abdominal pain, and it can, you know, really help, you know, Jason was alluding to earlier, help, help normalize, you know, these symptoms here so that they're able to, you know, to have a conversation about how they're going to engage in treatment and how they can um, um, address their, their needs um, for, for access to treatment. And so we'll do a first dose in the emergency department and then um, either um, send them out with a prescription for, you know, between, you know, a couple of days up to a week until we can get them into a follow-up appointment. Or you can consider having them coming back um, for um, redosing in the emergency department if there's no one with a, um, if there's no one with a waiver to prescribe um, for up to 72 hours, as Scott was talking about. Um, the other option, which may or may not be available to many of you, is that you, know, you can give them a dose in the emergency department, and then, you know, there are some places that will see them the next day. And so if you can just get them through Kind of get them through that initial withdrawal period, and there's not anybody able to prescribe, uh, you know, and they can just go to a bridge clinic or things like that, which I know are, are out there and available. Um, the one thing that I would advocate for, and I think it's very tempting, especially for, for many emergency physicians, to think, oh, well, you know, if they're not in withdrawal now, like, why would I have to prescribe if I can just give them one now and then they can go? Um, and so I think um, the thing that is, at least the, the thing that I think about is um, there's something so um, reassuring for these patients about you know, when that withdrawal kicks in in the middle of the night, if they have something else in their hand you know, to help, to help um, treat that withdrawal and treat that craving, um, even if they don't nece necessarily take it, they're just much more likely to, um, to, to go to treatment. You know? And so I think that you know, there's this kind of nuance of like, oh, well, you know, they're not withdrawn now, they'll be fine if they just go tomorrow. Um, but there's something about giving that prescription, oh, sorry, about giving that prescription um, to actually, you know, link them to treatment. And I think that's part of what we saw, um, you know, in the study that Gail and Steve did. Um, I think I'm just going to stop there about that. Um, so as far as developing a local program, so it takes a lot of different things. I don't know if many of you, how many people have programs here? How many people are actively trying to set up programs and... Okay. So there are, um, as you are probably well aware, many, many, many um, challenges um, to just anticipate if you have not already come across. Um, the things that you will need in order to do it effectively, um, you need local champions, um, which I imagine some of you are here. Um, you'll need community partners. You need leadership buy-in from your, both in your emergency department and your institution. Um, success stories can be very, very motivating, um, both for ED-initiated buprenorphine, but also for, you know, when you're talking about any sort of substance use disorder. You know, if you, you know, kind of loop back to um, physicians and say, hey, you remember that guy that you sent to treatment? Like, he got there and he's doing great and it's, you know, it's, and these, these things um, can be very, very rewarding um, and, and very much a feed-forward process because in the emergency department, as you all know, we often see people who are not doing well um, with addiction and I think that, um, you know, hearing that people are doing well um, is the, sometimes the only way to, to know that they're doing well because they're doing well so that we don't see them in our emergency department, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so, uh, also protocols um, is going to be an important part for getting a program up and running. Um, and then, you know, kind of know your resources, both locally and um, kind of nationally, on web and things like that. So, um, for community partners, um, you know, as was alluded to earlier, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't work very well if you don't have somewhere to send them to, somewhere that is, you know, expecting kind of your patients. Um, and so, you know, you really want to try to form a relationship with a local um, it would be a treatment program, primary care practice, um, you know, it's maybe a hospital resident clinic or federally health qualified health center, um, you know, somebody that, you know, will, you know, see your, see your patients. Um, and the important things to know is kind of what services do they offer, are there barriers around insurance and things along those lines, and then is there a wait list or mandatory waiting period. Um, one of the things about um, the opioid epidemic that we are in right now is that it's very easy to walk into someone you know, especially another, you know, physician and have a conversation about, you know, we see people in our community dying, what can we do to help, to help um, stop this? And so you're not going to get a lot of pushback, you know, of, of where people are not going to want to see your patients. There are certainly going to be some limitations around maybe they don't have space and, you know, you have to think about other creative ways to get more people wavered or to think about, um, you know, developing things like a, like a bridge clinic or transitions clinic. Um, there are several that have been kind of up and running. Um, you saw a couple of examples 
um, in Gail's talk yesterday, um, and Andrew has one, and there's one at Boston Medical Center. And so the question is kind of where can you send people and how do you s establish that, that loop of communication? And I think the important part is, is that um, the, the biggest thing is that if something goes wrong on either end, you want to have a conversation that can happen between two people. You know, whether a patient shows up and there's some problem, you want them to be able to feed back to the one person in the emergency department and say, hey, like this one thing happened and how can we, how can we optimize this process to make it work better? Um, similarly, if you have you know, an ED patient who, you know, for whatever reason, can't get there or can't get in, you want to have a contact person to say, hey, you know, we talked about making this work, like what, what happened? You know, why did the Tuesday slots go away or how can, how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? Um, so local champions, um, as I mentioned, I would suspect that there are many in the room, um, but they can really be anybody. Um, so it's certainly, you know, this doesn't work um, very well without ED physician and faculty buy-in. Um, I think it probably could, but it doesn't work very well. And so you, you certainly want faculty, but you also want the buy-in of administration, um, of residents, of nursing, um, social work, case managers, um, because the idea is that you know, as you develop these processes, if everyone who touches you know, the patient you know, isn't aware that this is something that is offered and something that you do, um, you can really just kind of torpedo the whole, the whole thing. Um, Andrew and I were talking yesterday about, you know, he actually kind of has signs out in his emergency department that, you know, basically say, you know, looking for help? Like we, I don't remember exactly what it says. But the idea is that it's very clear um, to everyone that works there, everyone kind of in that, that health space and to patients um, that this is a service that, that is offered. And that can actually be an alternative to sort of self-select for screening if you don't want to get into screening and kind of that whole, whole thing. Um, so other things um, to that your local champions will need to help you with is, you know, the, wa the waiver is, the waiver is a challenge. I mean, it is, physicians are busy, nurse practitioners, I mean, 24 hours is, is a ton of training, eight hours of training is a lot to ask of um, an emergency physician, and it's a, it's a hard sell. Um, but that being said, we, you know, do all kinds of other trainings for stroke scale and stroke and trauma and all of these other things, and so I think that, you know, if you can package it in a way that we just do it, um, you know, that may work ideally. What I would love to see is, is some sort of um, waiver around, kind of for the waiver, uh, for people who are, you know, prescribing for up to a week to, to link patients to treatment, but um, whether or not that's actually a realistic possibility. Um, I, I, would, I would try to figure out, focus on trying to figure out how to, to get people wavered. Um, and as Scott mentioned, there, there's free um, kind of four and four classes through the SAMHSA website. Um, and then there's other ideas about kind of do you need to consider other models? Um, and so there's, um, we're doing something, I was talking, talking through um, with, um, you know, lots of other hospitals kind of across the country for how they may approach it or how they can do it. I mean, there, there's, you know, people who are, the bridge clinic is certainly one way to do it. You can think about things like having, um, you know, a consultant come to the emergency department to prescribe buprenorphine and maybe it's only available nine to five. Um, you can think about having, you know, if you can think about having your PAs and, you know, APRNs and basically just have somebody available all the time and have them do it. I mean, there are a couple of different ways to think about doing it. But I think the important part is, is that, you know, this is something that um, can be done. It just needs a lot of, um, there's a lot of legwork to, that goes into figuring out how to get a program up and running. So um, you want to know who your allies are, both in the hospital and out. And I would say even more importantly, you want to know who, um, who to look out for, you know, and, and why, and what I mean by that is, you know, I mean, there are certainly, you know, people who are not interested in this, and, and that's, that's okay. Um, you know, my goal is not to make everybody this mandatory for everyone to do. I think that would be a mistake to um, kind of try to force this on people. I think the thing that's important is that we want to make sure that it is as easy as possible for people who want to do it and who are willing to do it. Um, and so if you can, um, identify those people who are going to be barriers at, at, at individual institutions um, and have conversations up front rather than, you know, have someone try to kind of slow you down on the back end of getting a program up from running. And also, you know, your social, social work, um, if you have navigators, health promotion advocates, um, you want to work closely with them because um, they can actually do a lot of the, the screening and the counseling and the brief intervention 
Um, because as we know, um, emergency physicians are incredibly busy and the idea of, of asking them to do more things um, may go over like a ton of bricks. And so the more that we can sort of delegate and, and identify other people in the emergency department that can, that can help with that um, flow, the happier everyone will be. Um, and then pharmacy is the other thing that I put down here because um, you know, many of us have ED pharmacists who um, are amazing and they do patient education, they do staff education, um, they can do academic detailing and things along those lines. Um, they also are the ones who are going to make sure that you actually have what you need in your Pixis um, and you know, can help work with you to make sure that your local pharmacies actually stock it. Um, so there's some kind of logistic things like that. Um, so we're going to anticipate challenges um, around, you know, specifically around buprenorphine. So waiver we talked about, you know, form, you know, is it on your hospital formulary? Is it in your Pixis in the ED? Um, in many states, um, there's actually a, a, an insurance prior authorization requirement, um, which uh, is a huge um, challenge. Um, so you just want to, you just want to be aware about about issues like that, um, you know, and if that's something that your know, patients are not going to be able to fill. So it's about it's about ten dollars, about ten dollars a pill, is, is what it. Yeah, and so so it depends on where you're linking them to. Um, many, um, our hospital has a, like a free care for up to a week for all all medications, um, but um, but yeah, it depends on, on where you are. But it's it's not cheap, um, and so um, uninsured patients that, that can certainly be a challenge, um, and uh, you want to know if it's carried at your local pharmacy. And then there's also patient challenges around kind of ID and transportation and insurance, you know, as we, and cost, um, which we just um, kind of reviewed. Other challenges, um, you know, and we already talked about this, kind of anticipate some resistance around any increased workload. Um, I think we're all feeling very, very, very stretched, um, both, you know, physicians and um, nurses and social workers. And so anything you can, you can, you can do to help, help offset um, or, or spread um, the workload when you're trying to get a program like this up, up and running um, is um, going to be uh, viewed more favorably. Um, and then the other thing is to always think about like what motivates, you know, what, what, like how do you motivate people and what would motivate people to, to be willing to do this kind of in their space. And so um, some of it is, and obviously everyone's motivated by patient care. Everybody wants good patient care. Um, but there are other specific things that, for example, um, you know, in talking to you know specific programs like, um, so for example, like case managers, like one of the things that they're evaluated on is like reducing repeat ED visits. So we can, if you can figure a way to kind of leverage, you know, that in the care of the patient, you know, that's something that may may specifically motivate them. Or if you have you know a, an entire wing of your emergency department that is, um, you know, holding you know patients that are, you know, feeling suicidal because they're in withdrawal and can't get help for their opioid use disorder and. Um, you know, really that the core treatment is actually that they can't get treatment for their opioid use disorder. If you can, you know, your administration section, you know, might be interested in reducing your length of stay if you can actually just get them into treatment and get them on their way. Um, you know, there, there are different things that motivate different people. So I would just encourage you to think about that when you're having these conversations. Because um, a lot of this is about, some of this is about, um, you know, how you do it. And some of it is just about how you work with people in order to, to facilitate these things happening. Um, and staff safety is another issue, um, you know, that um, unfortunately comes up, so, you know, sometimes, and I put staff safety there as, you know, if you are treating somebody's withdrawal, um, it is going to be a safer space <laughs> in the emergency department than, um, than, than when you don't. And it, it's not a, um, it's just something to consider when you think about all of, all of the potential benefits um, for this. Um, and then patient satisfaction um, is another thing. So. Um, so for making progress, so you know, you certainly want to engage your stakeholders, um, and a lot of this is really about you know a lot of a lot of this is about you know actually prescribing the buprenorphine um, and getting linking patients to evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder. But a lot of this is also just about changing um, changing the culture of how we think about addiction and opioid use disorder in the emergency department. And so um, I would say even if you you know are having a, lots of barriers around you know getting someone to prescribe buprenorphine. If you're having these conversations in your emergency department about how to get people linked to effective care, I think that's actually um, an incredibly important part of, of changing the culture um, and doing more to further the, kind of our understanding and education around addiction um, 
because that's not necessarily, as you know, a huge part of medical education or emergency medicine training. Um, so it will not happen overnight. It will take um, quite a long time, um, hopefully not too long. Um, but um, and you want to make it as easy as, as possible. And you know, this this is a mantra here. Whoa, this is a mantra here. You know, this is really just about improving patient care. You know, and I think you know, like if you think about how you settle conflicts with, you know, consultants or off service residents and people are kind of getting riled up and kind of have their own stuff in it. And I mean, if you always, always come back to this, this is what's in the, in the best interest. I'm doing what I think is in the best interest of the patient. And I would love it if we could work together to make this happen. And I think that if you can come back to that centering um, thing, um, that that can actually be um, instrumental in, in moving forward with these programs. I'm, I'm a little bit of an optimist, but, <laughs> um, but I do think it helps. Um, and so, um, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, so I, I just, uh, I don't want to interrupt. I just want to leave time for questions because that was a lot of stuff. Um, before we wrap up, does anybody have questions so far? Anything we've heard? How about you, Ethan? In addition to substance use disorder, opioid use disorder, hep C, HIV, and then how difficult has it been to find resources for patients who may be active injection drug users but also hep C positive or co-infected with HCV and HIV? You know, I think it's more difficult to find resources for those patients than just patients that have opioid use disorder and need medication-assisted treatment. I'm happy to quickly say what we do. So. Uh, there's, uh, it's a lot of legwork is to find out who accepts what's in the community, to Kate's point. I mean, you need to know ahead of time that you're referring people to the right place so that you have the highest chance of success. So we sort of stratify our follow-up based on a number of things. Uh, it's not ideal, but it's realistic. You know, where they have insurance, comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities, if they're dual diagnosis, things like that, so that when we're referring them, we're making sure you know, if they don't have insurance, that they're going to the place which will help get them insurance, right? Um, if they're a, a CEO, um, are they not, you know, the reality is is that they're not going to follow up in a place with the same person that doesn't have insurance. So you, you have to have, I think, realistic expectations of where people are going and then be in constant communication as to what they can and cannot handle. And as Kate said, that's a two-way street. So you want to hear back from, you want to have open communication with the people you're referring to um, and uh, also into uh, treatment facilities and stuff so that, because there's a lot of people that end up in treatment facilities that are not appropriate there either. Just really briefly, we opened our bridge clinic about two months ago. It's actually the clinical director is an ID doc, and so she's really aggressive about testing. And something like 70% of our patients were Hep C positive, and a little you know fewer were HIV positive. Um, so it just has to. I, I don't think it, it's the the primary role of the ED, but as long as it's connected to the to the treatment, it can't just be about just the opioid use disorder. There's all these other medical problems that go along with it, with it as well. Yeah, but just sorry, just to chime in there. I also I also think that it's okay to to be just about the opioid use disorder. You know, and is that we can't fix the world. You know, in that uh, Highland is an opt out HIV and Hep C, so everyone gets screened. Um, access is a big pain for Hep C, but the, if you want to get someone treated for Hep C who's snorting heroin, what's the best way to get them into treatment? Get them off heroin. So it's just to remember. You know, it, it's okay just to treat the little thing, because you can't fix homelessness, you can't fix HIV, you can't fix all this stuff. But there's this one little piece of the pie you can make a really significant impact on. First of all, thank you guys so much for the presentation and for talking through sort of the high level on this. Um, I just sort of in the spirit of physician advocacy and physician organizing and collective impact, Many in the room might think, after hearing Scott's presentation um, about the Data 2000 uh, Act, many in the room might think something along the lines of, why are we doing this for this medication? Why do we have to go through so many loopholes? Eight-hour training course, $200. It's the only medication in the, in the country in the formulary where we have to go through these many loopholes. But for something like fentanyl or morphine, we can write those prescriptions right now. And so I'm just thinking about, you know, at what, where are we at with our current thought process on organizing to change the federal law? Are there, are there groups that are actively sort of thinking about doing that? Um, as far as I understand, there are two different routes. The first is actually trying to potentially amend, you'd have to go back to the Harrison Act of 1914 or something, uh, amend that initial 
uh, law so that we can treat this medication like any other medication. Or the second is to talk to the DEA and that 72 hour rule is good, but unfortunately it only lets us do 24 hour sprints. So someone has to come back three days in a row to the ED causing our bounce back rates to, to, to bump up. So I'm just wondering where we're at in terms of physician advocacy to try to change this because people's lives are on the line. So I mean, I'm happy to at least tell you kind of what, what I, my understanding of where we are with that now. So next week is ASEP's Leadership and Advocacy Conference. Um, and there, you know, that is certainly something that was um, a discussion around kind of what they could do, what they should do, what's available. And um, the um, idea is, you know, there are discussions about it. <laughs> um, they're not officially lobbying for it next week. There was um, a bri apparently a briefly an amendment for one of the bills around making the, tr modifying the 72 hour waiver through the DEA to actually make it for take home as opposed to having to come back to be redosed. But apparently the, the senator that put that in the bill that was retracted less than 24 hours later. So I don't have a great answer for where we are moving forward other than there are a lot of people paying attention to it, um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know the advocacy, but I would say that the onus is on us to produce data to change it. So most policy changes are not uh, super aggressive, right? They're very conservative at first. And so now it's been like this for a long time. So we should be able to produce the data that this, what we're doing is safe. Um, and it's incumbent upon people in our specialty to do that, to say it's safe. Here we've proven it's safe. Now take off all these dumb restrictions. And uh, the other part of that is just um, remember advocacy at the state level too. So how it's happening through Massachusetts is our governor is a big proponent of this. So we go and talk to our representatives and our governor. And now we understand that the governor is actually working to, to on the, work on the federal government. So imagine if all of us do this, then there's a lot more pressure. So, um, you know, I, I think this is the elephant in the room. So after yesterday's plenary session, my intent was to roll this uh, type of program out across 14 to 18 different emergency departments in my uh, area. Ideally to do that in a 18, 12 to 18 month time frame. Um, that's, that's what I do as my career. Um, you know, this issue makes this a no-go. There is no way I can, um, uh, in, you know, uh, enroll essentially 200 emergency physicians and 150 uh, physician assistants. Um, so I, I think, you know, throwing down the gauntlet, I think that that is, if, if we want to move the needle, that's the step that needs to be taken to make this a success beyond the initial phase that, you know, just, just like we're improving STEMI care and we made it a national priority to save these lives, that's, you know, I have to be able to have all my physicians. And I'm going to disagree with when you said, you know, there are some people who are going to be um, against this and you can't force this upon everybody. I think you actually can. That I think that this is a matter of leadership and encouragement and metrics and I think you can actually get people to play ball. Um, but uh, I think that's a necessary thing because if one person comes into the emergency department with the expectation that they're going to have access to MAT and I turn them away because I say I'm not a believer, we have a problem. Um, and that patient should be able to walk into any one of my facilities and get the exact same care. I, I often talk about how mom should get the same cardiac care no matter which facility in my system she, uh, and which uh, physician she sees. I think the same is true for somebody who has an opioid use disorder. So I would say that there are, there's definitely a lot of money out there that you can give people a carrot rather than a stick. We've done that in Colorado. We've got about 600 new people trained over the past year. And so you can look into to the uh, STR grants from the CDC where each state is getting a tremendous amount of money and start talking to your Department of Public Health. And uh, it really softens the blow. And, and to be honest, um, now that it's an online course um, or something you watch, it is not eight hours. Um, and I've talked to our PAs who have done it, and it's not 24 hours. I mean, you can go through it. I'm not encouraging this, but I'm just saying you can go through it a lot faster. And if you have a carrot there, we've easily gotten most of our staff up. Everybody who's, who's had any interest at all, if you offset, they're getting, if they get their, they go all the way to get their X waiver, they get basically $1,000 for their time. And so, um, pushing it on people um, can definitely get it done. I don't know how much it's going to encourage them. If you can make, 
uh, cogent argument and then facilitate their training with a little bit of, of money to offset their time. Um, I think that's been very successful for us. Re hopefully that's not going to come from our ED budgets, but I will tell you there's a lot of public health dollars out there. And with what's anticipated for this year, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens, but it, it is going to be, the budget is going to be quite, quite high for opioid use stuff. Sure. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, all the work is awesome, and I think there's going to be a big spike after this conference and people getting x wavered and you guys are saving lives. Uh, my question is, what do you see uh, as the potential role for mHealth and eHealth and telemedicine in terms of both expanding buprenorphine access and filling the treatment gap? Because a lot of, I think a lot of us practice in very treatment-rich environments like Manhattan, where you can throw a rock and hit a, a treatment and detox center. But a lot of places, like especially in rural parts of the Midwest, et cetera, have very limited access. And I'm wondering if you guys could address that. So there's a, something called the Ryan Height Act, 2008. Um, which limits some of this, although I will tell you, I'm only halfway through reading it. Yesterday I just got something from the DEA, which makes me think that um, it's now being more encouraged based on what I've read so far. Yeah, so I think it's to be determined, but definitely should be an option. Uh, our state tried it a while ago, and I think their interpretation was different than what I'm reading here. Uh, hi, Dave Leith uh, from York, Pennsylvania. Thank you again. Uh, I had some questions, um, maybe some granular questions. Uh, we're trying to implement um, MAT in our system. Um, and again, there's, this drug is so heavily regulated, and even setting up the process and protocols, um, we have to go through all these hoops. So things like, how do you identify a patient, a return visit patient, because the law says you can only do it once for that patient. How do you ex put a log for each provider for their 100 patients that they're only limited to prescribe. Um, do you do expert billing with these patients? And have you been audited? Just, just for the first part of the question, so the, the, that three-day exception, that's if you don't have a waiver and you're just doing it in the ED. So if you have a waiver, then you can write a prescription. And that, that's, in that 72-hour provision, it's only a one-time 72 hours. But the is data 2000 one, is not for per patient per that patient. So if John Doe shows up again, right? So that's that's part of that other that other CFR law. That's not part of data 2000. So that's that that, that exception. So if we don't have a waiver, you're going to do a day at a time for three days. That's only good for 72 hours. There's nothing to stop a patient from coming back and getting repetitive prescriptions if you have a waiver. That's a whole other issue, obviously. Um, you want to talk about the next? Um, so the other question was um, expert. Um, so we certainly have it and we do it in our emergency department. Um, I don't think that we, I know you, we can bill for it. I'm not sure that we actually, I don't think it actually increases um, our bill because it's about bundled payments. We're looking at it for, because we have our social workers um, and so I, I hopefully in a year from now we'll have some more data about it. About We're trying to offset the costs so that the grant money we have uh, is sustainable. So we'll, we'll have that. Uh, it, you can definitely be audited. Uh, I've not been audited. I think it's reasonable to keep a list. Um, you can typically, if you're e-prescribing all this stuff, you can print out the number of people that you've prescribed for pretty easily. Um, and remember that that number changes as soon as that prescription goes out. So it's not 100 per year. It's 100 at any given time, which is probably not an issue for most emergency department people, unless you're running a complex program yourself. But uh, so I want to end it there. Thanks, everybody, for your time. We appreciate the support and the questions.